One, two, three, four. Palapalooza. Palapalooza. We're talking to you. I'm Palapalooza. Zach Goody, Gould Spoon, divided by zero. How are you, my friend? How are you, buddy? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, that's great. So you're recording on your end, right? Yeah, I just uh, never tried this setup before, but I um, I got the headpiece in, so it's not going to pick up your end, and it'll just pick up my end, and then I can just send you the wave, and you should be able to line it up later on, I guess. Yeah, that's perfect. You have like a little home studio? Yeah, I do. Um, well, I do recording, but I also do some voiceover work. So I've been, uh, I kind of upgraded my setup. I got a big job last year. And so I upgraded my whole setup to uh, get like a new Apollo twin and new MacBook and stuff like that. So I got a nice mic and everything. Yeah. Nice. Awesome. What kind of voiceover work do you do? Uh, I started out doing some music stuff for a buddy of mine who I play with in a band up here in LA. And, um, he had a few kind of musical projects that came his way. Uh, that's kind of what they do. It's like a jingle house where they, you know, do movie and TV themes and things like that. And, uh, he had a few commercial jobs come up and whenever something musical comes up, he just kind of gives me a shot. Like, Hey, you want to try to write it, you know, this for Dr. Pepper or whatever. So he tried a few of them and, uh, nothing kind of stuck. Like we kind of made it, it's very competitive obviously. Right. And, um, so then we did a few of them and then we did this Taco Bell one last year really? and we kind of kept, kind of kept making it to like the next level, the next, <laughs> the next round or whatever. And uh, they give you revisions, you know, change this word, change that, change this, you know, whatever. And uh, finally we got the job, we got the gig and it was like a national, uh, it was a national TV and radio commercial for Taco Bell. It was the, um, like the punk rock sort of uh, the, <laughs> the party pack, the party pack Taco Bell punk rock commercial that you might may have seen. What does everyone want tonight? Tacos, tacos. Now what's gonna stop this party off right? Tacos. It's on YouTube and I have like, um, I built my own, since I, since that happened, I kind of got an agent and started doing more work. So I built a website, ZachGoody.com and it has basically all of my bands, all of my, you know, voiceover all compiled onto one website with all my clips and stuff. That's awesome. What's that? What's that website? It's just my name, ZachGoody.com. Ghoul Spoon going corporate, huh? <laughs> yeah, it was it was it was something that kind of came. I wasn't looking for it. It kind of came out of that we did it as a goof because the song is like you know what does everyone want tonight tacos and we were like it was like it was like a, a goof yeah and uh, they, they loved it and then we just kind of like okay and then it was a, it was a SAG job which meant it paid residuals okay so I just started getting checks in the mail I was like whoa this is the business I should have been in uh, a long time ago that's rad. <laughs> Cool Spoon, obviously, legends here in San Diego, active 89 to about 01, somewhere around there, right? Uh, we actually, yeah, the band, the band formed, I believe, in 89 in Hawaii um, with a different singer. That's, that's kind of when I met them. We all lived in Hawaii, but um, we all moved together to San Diego and right, right around summer, hollo I, I call it Halloween of 91. Okay. Uh -huh. That was our first. Yeah, that was the first time I met them. I knew the I knew Jeremy and Marcus uh, from Hawaii. The drummer Doug, I did not know. He was. Uh, they had moved to Tacoma for a year to try to make it with a different singer. Um, in like in like I believe it was 1990, and we stayed in touch. And then they had issues with their singer, and they ended up kicking him out. And they're like, "Hey, we're going to move to San Diego because Marcus like lived there when he was a kid. Do you want to?" Do you want to? So I was like, ah, oh, sure. I'll, you know, <laughs> they sent me a demo and it was pretty cool. It was like, imagine like summer of 91 and it was like reggae, metal, weird, funky, you know, nothing was really happening. Um, there was like Mr. Bungle and, you know, Red Hots to a degree. And that was about it. There was no other kind of bands like that. So I was like, great. So, you know, sounds like right up my alley. So I bought a car, packed up all my stuff and just drove cross country by myself and met them in San Diego. Wow. Incredible. And it timed out perfectly because I mean, you found yourself right in the middle of that nineties San Diego music explosion, right? Yeah, we really did. I mean, it was, it was an incredible time to be alive. I mean, it's, uh, it was, it was, it, it kind of added another layer. I mean, I've told the story a million times, but it added another layer of, of, 
sort of relevance because as I was driving cross country, I stopped kind of, I took my time and stopped to visit friends along the way. And I visited a friend in Boulder, I want to say Colorado. And it was probably September of 91. And he was like, He's like, come with me. We have, we have to. I, I'm going to make you buy this cassette right now. This, this is the greatest thing ever. So he, he took me to like whatever the mall or whatever it was in Boulder, and uh, he made me buy Nevermind. You know, Nirvana Nevermind had just come out. I'd never heard of it before. Yeah. And uh, so I, you know, I was driving cross country by myself. I was crank. I loved it. It was like, yeah, this band Nirvana. I was, you know, I thought I was like cutting edge. You know. Yeah. Um, because I didn't really have, M- I didn't really have MTV. I was driving cross country. I saw like, you know, I think U2, Octung Baby was the big album at the time. Okay. Yeah. And um. And, uh, so I, so I, so I get to, uh, I get to San Diego and, you know, meet up with the guys who would later become Ghoul Spoon. And I'm like, guys, have you heard this, 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 this band Nirvana? They're like the fucking coolest, you know, the greatest best album, you know, awesome. And they're like, uh, yeah, those are our, na- those are our buddies. Those are our neighbors. We just left Tacoma. Like literally those are, <laughs> those are like our buddies that we just left Tacoma cause there was no music scene there. Wow. I'm like, are you so-, <laughs> so, so literally like they had been like their buddies for like the last year and they had a gig opening for Nirvana when their like previous singer had like gone off the rails and they ended up kicking him out. And that's one of the reasons they moved to San Diego. Wow. So it was like this weird kind of, so I was like, what? And, uh, so um, Marcus, our bass player, kind of stayed in touch with them a little bit, yeah. uh, especially Chris, who I guess was more of the, like the, you know, people person in their band, right. or whatever. Bass player, yeah. And um, yeah, so um, it's kind of like it became this big story. But we, um, our first album came out uh, right around Christmas of '93, yeah. and we had our C- our CD release party at the C- old Casbah, which is now where I guess it was the Cover Room. Yeah, and. Um, and so it was. It was like we. I think we we probably headline played last, like eleven o'clock, mm-hmm. and just totally coincidentally, mm-hmm. Nirvana was playing the sports arena that same exact night on the In Utero tour. No, so you could look it up. It was pro- probably December twenty fifth or eighth or something right. of ninety three. Wow. And uh, Marcus went to the sports arena to go see Nirvana. We were because he was Marcus is kind of the wild card of the band. He's, you know, always showing up late and like, you know, just barely making it with his bass. And we're like, oh dude, you're gonna go to a show? Like, come on, we have a gig tonight. So he's like, Don't worry, don't worry, I'll be back, I'll be back. So he goes to see Nirvana. We're like stressing out, like, where's Marcus? Where's Marcus? We have to go on stage. <laughs> he shows up with he, he, sh- he shows up at the last minute with Chris Novoselic and Bobcat Goldthwait. What? <laughs> Holy who, shit. Who, was, who, who I guess was the MC for that tour because he's like he was like really good friends with Kurt. How funny. So dude. They, 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 they watched our whole show and like loved it. And like M- Chris jumps on stage with us, like drunk as balls and like jams with us. Wow. And like, you know, p- like starts playing Zeppelin covers with us like all night. And like everyone's like, what the hell is Nirvana? And like, of course, that was before cell phones, like no one got any pictures or video of it right but it became <laughs> so that was a pretty awesome like uh, early ghoul spoon memory that is amazing and that would have been at the original casbah like you mentioned right yeah I, th- I believe it held like the capacity was like 94 people although they could probably cram like 250 in there and the legendary tim mays was still running it back then right tim mays yeah i think they started in 89 so that was already uh, a couple years into their run before they switched locations to down the street what an insane story. That's awesome. So yeah. did you ever play with them after that? I mean, that sounds like that would have been their last tour, right? It, yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah, pretty soon after that, that was the end. I mean, within the, within a year, because he died in 94. April of 94, which would have been four months after that, which happened to be my birthday. My birthday is April 9th. And we were playing a show that like a birthday show that day. And everyone's like, dude, Kirk killed himself. Like, what the? F-? So I always remember they found the body on my birthday. Wow. <laughs> that date that date always sticks out to me. What a fucking bummer. <laughs> yeah, so so no, I I personally never got to meet him, but right. um th- those guys had like the demos. I think demos exist of I want to say it's the songs from Nevermind but produced by uh the guy who produced Bleach or something like it was it was okay. before Butch Vig got a hold of it, so it was like a different version of it or something and mm-hmm. They had like demos or I don't remember it was years, 30 years ago, but yes, yeah. yeah, they had the inside track to the Nirvana, the Nirvana guys. You did share the stage with all sorts of local legends, obviously, Sprum Monkey, Unwritten Law, P.O.D., Blink. We just had Bucko9, uh, Craig, on the podcast. Totally. Uh, how was it back in, in the 90s sharing the stage with all those incredible bands? Did you guys get along? Was it pretty competitive? It was only competitive uh, to the point that we only, you know, I'm, I assume you're kind of talking about the Soma scene more than the other places because Soma was sort of our, you know, our home 
you know, that was our main place we played sure. the most because we yeah. were all, you know, either just turned 21 or just about to be 21. Yeah. Um, so the only, co the only competition was that we wanted, we only got paid if you said our name at the door. So that was, that was really the only competition. It was like, you know, we would all go up and down the line. Hey, say Goolspoon at the door. Hey, say Bucko Nine at the door. You know, passing them stickers and doing mailing lists. I mean, <laughs> I remember that. Yeah. yeah. So that was like, cause you get, you got a dollar. Basically you, you, you start off playing the, this is the old location downtown before it moved twice. And we started playing there. I want to say February 92 is our first show. Okay. And, uh, you, basically, you play the dungeon, which is like this grimy underground like stage. Yeah. And then, if you could, if you could get a hundred people to say your name at the door, then you can play the main stage, which was like this huge. I mean, it was probably held two thousand people. It was a big, big room. And I mean, even by today's standards, you know, it's, it's a pretty big room, right? Especially for local bands. So we played. So we, yeah, so we played two shows in the dungeon, and we drew a hundred people the second show, and uh, we got to play the main floor. And so we became, you know all of a sudden we got to be friends and knew about all these other bands that were there that were sort of coming up at the same time as us. So yeah, we didn't, there really wasn't, there's the average, you know, the typical sort of like, Oh, you know, those guys, you know, just like every band talks shit about each other. I don't care what they say, you know, <laughs> behind their back. <laughs> but those, oh, that new song sucks. That new song's great, whatever, you know, but not, there really wasn't any, uh, bitterness. I can't think of any like actual rivalries. Like the cool thing about the old Soma scene is that, all the bands were so different that they all kind of held their own little place there. You know, the, the main, you know, I'm sure you know, but the main, like sort of the, when we got there, the main, main bands were sprung monkey who sort of had their own, like they were legendary cause they were like from there. They grew up there. They were local boys. <laughs> They're awesome. Um, they were kind of more of the suicidal punk, you know, kind of vibe. Yeah. Um, and then there was um, Flat Manhattan, who was like straight up just badass funk, like funkadelic, you know, Red Hot Chili Peppers, just awesome. And those guys became our great friends. And their drummer Jason ended up joining our band later on. I want you. I think I see. It's only what you think you see. Now it's a whole lot. Under the surface, now it's a whole lot. So they were totally unique. Like there was no band that that, were, that was like they were like total cartoon rock, just awesome. Um, nice. and then there was Honey Glaze, and they were incredible. They were more like a you know funky Jane's Addictiony kind of like groove bands. And you know Gary, their singer Gary Shuffler ended up he's still active, doing tons of awesome cover stuff. And Josh, their bass player, ended up joining Fluff for many, many years. Yeah, of course. So there was, there was Honey Glaze, Flat Manhattan, Sprung Monkey, and then uh, Unwritten Law were still pretty young, but they were more punk, you know, that straight up kind of like epitaph sound, yeah. which wasn't really our, you know, they weren't competing for our same kind of scene. Sure. And uh, Blink was still kind of little grommets and like slightly stupid, were still real young. So those guys hadn't kind of, you know, headlined yet. And uh, P.O.D. had their own scene also because they were like Christian rap rock and they had their dad had a record label. So they had like a sort of a built in sort of like scene and touring sort of audience. They had their own kind of vibe going. Yeah. And um, who else is there? Bucko Nine was Ska. So they were had their own kind of crowd as well. Um, so, yeah, so like all the bands were really different um, and we didn't really compete for the same kind of blueprint of music, you know? Sure. So it wasn't really an issue. Yeah, you guys were certainly unique, and we're talking about Soma. I think the, the way we got connected was that page on Facebook. Uh, the listeners can go and check it out, Soma Live on Union and Metro Street. It's a bunch of people posting like nostalgic stuff from Soma, and I see, I'm looking yeah. at one of your posts right now. You have a bunch of VHS tapes of uh, Ghoulspoon at Soma, and you make reference to uh, Dream Street with corn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I found these videotapes, which I haven't looked at in almost 30 years, just sitting in my garage, and I'm like, i got to digitize these at some point. <laughs> right. So I, bought, so I bought the little adapter and uh, started posting them a couple weeks ago, and um, yeah, there was one show at the old Soma called The Big One, because that was like after the... Actually, that, that would have been before the 94 Quake. Yeah. Right around there, but um, maybe it was right around there, but it was called The Big One, and it was like all the top bands at the time. So it was us, Bucko Nine, Sprung Monkey, Flat in Manhattan, uh, Unwritten Law, and I want to say, and Freak, a band called Freak Scene, who is, uh, they were awesome too. They were like a super funky band, and their bass player is now in a band called L1011, 
which is a huge sort of touring, uh, like technical kind of prog band or indie prog. I don't know what you, what you call them, but yeah. So I, I digitized that show and I have some other ones that I haven't even posted yet. Like I have like the making of our first album I found, which I had never, I still haven't even watched. The Dream Street show is actually terrible. I didn't even post it because whoever taped it, like the lighting is terrible. The monitors feeding back the whole time. They cut off our set and they didn't, uh, film corn at all. So, oh, shit. So, uh, so I was like, all right, well, but yeah, that was one of the early ones that we, um, what kind of happened with our trajectory is we started in 91. Yeah. We had about two or three years of just like super success, basically, right? You know, we're playing Soma, 2000 people, these great scene, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden Soma closed and they're like, we're, you know, they just, they just closed. Okay. And we were just like, uh, you know, now what? So we kind of, had to make the transition to being a bar band, which is a totally different kind of vibe, you know? Right. Um, so we, we did that for a few years until the new Soma moved and reopened. But in that time, our, you know, the, the kids changed and grew up and graduated high school. And so the whole scene kind of morphed a little bit. And um, in those two or three years of, of non-all-ages venues in San Diego, we played a lot of the bars. So it was, you know, Dream Street. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure if Brick by Brick was there yet or whether it was still the Spirit Club, but, you know, Casbah, yeah. there was Bodie's downtown. Um, mm -hmm. There was a bunch of them. But, uh, yeah, for some reason, we kind of um, became the band that everybody... Like we were the undefinable band, you know, like we're kind of funky, kind of reggae, kind of metal, <laughs> kind of rap, kind of, you know, so sure. any band that came to town that couldn't be defined as punk, ska, metal, or, you know, reggae, they right. put with us. Yeah. So we were, so we would open, you know, whatever new band came to town, it'd be like the Cherry Pop and Daddies, put it with Gold Spoon, <laughs> you know, uh, like who else? So Fungo Mungo, that was a big one at the time. Um, yeah. Uh, smoke and rhythm prawns. They were awesome. They were like a Primus type band. So all these like weird sort of like funky bands they would put with us. Right. And um, like Sublime, that was another one because they were kind of undefinable. They would you know they would open for us. Oh, okay. um, awesome. Uh, man. But uh, so yeah, that was right when Corn was just starting. So they were one of the bands that um, Tim Hall, especially who is a great guy, great promoter in in San Diego, he put us with them three or four times. You know before they got signed. So that wow. was sort of like a little connection we had. And then. Wow. They basically they basically opened for Ghoul Spoon <laughs> two or three times, and then uh, everyone saw how great they were, and then we started opening for them. <laughs> that was pretty much that, that was pretty much how it went, and then they got signed, and you know, the rest is history, and they had a great career. Same with right. Deftones, and you know I could name a bunch of bands like that, but right. Um, uh, yeah, I went through the list. I mean, the list is pretty extensive. Incubus, Three Eleven, No Doubt, Sublime, Kid Rock. You, you share the stage <laughs> with all these guys, huh? I do, yeah, I do have a lot of old flyers and uh, Craziness. a lot of memories. Yeah, no, it was it was just that was just the time. It was uh, sort of every other genre had been kind of done, and the '90s was sort of like all this, all these bands that were doing all these weird, funky things, which ended up kind of like becoming new metal, which sort of like then the scene kind of totally changed and became a whole different vibe, and we kind of tapped out at that point. But uh, yeah. for the first half of the nineties, it was like, it wasn't new metal. It was just like, we would joke like, Hey, what, what are you guys called? And we're like, uh, we're kind of crunch. We're kind of rap. We call it crap. You know? <laughs> and then we, we had to, we had to make up, we, we had to make up a name for our style. So we, we called it uh horror doppelganger lounge rap. That was one of the ones we came up with. But uh, yeah, so, so basically, so basically we just played with everybody and um, never quite fit in. Yeah. And it was cool. We got to kind of dip our toes in the different scenes and not get pigeonholed into one, into one scene, which was good and also bad. Cause we didn't really have that, you know, built in sort of crowd. Cause some of these like, like Soma shows that were all ska, you have thousands of kids that just want to see a ska band and they love it and they're down with the, 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 the you know, the, the clothing and the culture and it's like a whole scene right. and we didn't really have a built in scene. So we sort of had to just kind of be weird and do our own thing, which was good and bad. Did you get out of town a lot? Did you tour? We did tour regionally. Um, we never really got too far beyond the Bay area, Vegas, Arizona. Like we did West coast stuff. Okay. Cool. Um, but it, it was one of the, one of the things about, our situation was that we were all broke. We all had day jobs and we all had apartments to like pay our rent. So we, we tried our best and we never had a manager. That was the other thing or a label. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, besides a couple independent labels that put our stuff out, but there was no, you know, tour support or thing, you know, major distribution. So it was, it was, we did our best. It was, I mean, looking back, I really wish we had just said, you know, 
just you know quit our jobs and just go go on tour forever and we probably would have had more success i mean we definitely would have right. but we had issues we had member issues we had drug issues we had you know you know <laughs> argument issues and ego issues and all the stuff that bands have and i read on discogs.com that you went through enough scandal and debauchery to fill a two part vh1 special that's that's actually <laughs> on the internet dude <laughs> Is, is that that's that's on Discogs? Or? Yeah, we, we've got to hear about you know a couple stories at least, dude. Oh, I don't know about I don't know about that, but I mean we went through <laughs> our, 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 our our drummer our drummer had some issues, and we had when we parted ways um, with him in ninety five ish, um, okay. and we brought on Jason from Flat in Manhattan, who is you know still a good friend to this day. Oh, cool. Um, so that was that was sort of a that was sort of a blip, and then uh, Marcus, our original bass player, um, he left. And so we brought on Rice, who's a great bass player, great friend. He stayed with us till the very end. Um, we added an, we added Jason Cooper, who was in Electric Kool Aid and Trip to Thane, and he joined the band as a second guitar player. So we had lineup changes, um, just a lot of sort of. No, I mean I don't want to. They're they're not interesting enough to to talk right. about. But sure. we had we had issues here and there. But we. We we got along for the most part, <laughs> yeah. and we we had a good run. I mean, uh, we we ended up changing our name in two thousand two. Yeah, divided by zero. To divided by zero, yeah. and that was uh, basically the same band, but we we changed guitar players. That was about it. That lasted until I want to say two thousand seven or something. So okay. all told, I mean, from the beginning till the very end, it was seventeen years with the same core group of guys. Yeah, incredible. It was a good run, but it's just hard when you have. You know, no manager, no agent, no real resource to tour, no backup plan. And um, our style wasn't very commercial. Like looking like back then, I was like, wow, we, you know, we have this great sound. But looking sure. back on it, I'm like, I don't think we had that hit, you know, single or, you know, sound. Like what we had one song that was reggae, one song that was rap, one song that was death metal. It was just it was very all over the place and not commercial, you know? You know, a, a modern day commercial band that sort of reminds me of you guys is uh, 311, a little bit. Yeah, uh, to a degree. I mean, to a degree. They're, sure. they were definitely kindred spirits in the early 90s. Like, we had, we had never heard of them right. until that show at Soma, at the news when Soma reopened in 94 or 5. We played a show there with Corn, Three Eleven, and Us. Crazy, and uh, wow. and a band called a band called Chronic Meter, who were good friends of ours. I think they opened, but um, so that was sort of like the that was sort of the big Soma show that people talk about. Um, that was a great show, but I would literally never heard of Three Eleven, and we were just in the middle of like you know the excitement of Corn because they just got signed and their album came out and they were you know getting big, you know touring with Marilyn Manson or whoever, yeah. and uh, I was like these guys are going to be huge, and then Three Eleven was headlining, and I'm like who is this band Three Eleven, and uh, Brian from Corn he was like or head whatever he mm -hmm. he's we were like on his bus hanging out he's like yeah we gotta go watch the band Three Eleven they're they're great so we we stood on the side of the stage and watched them play and they're like wow these guys are got their shit together like so yeah they were definitely they were a little bit more um groove reggae kind of like you know peaceful vibe type of thing and we were more sort of like a little heavier and more comedic sure. and <laughs> weird yeah but yeah for sure yeah a little more tamed down version of of gold spoon you know what i mean but yeah. you, you made reference to good songs and and yeah musicians lose track of that a little bit i think right it, it, it really is about the the singles it's about the music right yeah, I mean, I think uh, it really is. I mean, especially now is. I mean, I didn't even realize that I didn't know how to write a song until I was probably thirty, thirty-five. Like I was like, oh, this is how it's. You know, when you study right. classic songwriting and you know Beatles type stuff, you're like, oh, I wish I knew this when I was twenty-one. I just, right. I was, I wrote lyrics. You know, I didn't really understand how to write songs back then. And um, a lot of our songs, I mean, it's a lot of our. I don't want to say compromises, but they were such an amalgamation of our influences that we never had. A principal songwriter, you know, so it's like one guy would have a riff, then it's okay, add the reggae part in the middle. Okay, cool, I'm gonna add a rap verse, but for the chorus, we wanna have, you know, so <laughs> a lot of, and then, and then these songs would be seven minutes long, you know, and we're like, right. we, like I look back and like, what were we thinking? Why don't we just have like, you know, <laughs> a three and a half minute hit, you know? ADD metal rap. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, so, but it was, it, people liked it. We, we, we had some good stuff. I mean, looking back, there was good stuff, but, um, we definitely could have, you know, had a little more commercial sound. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, I hear you. You certainly had a unique sound, and I, I feel like that really contributed to your your name and your success. 
I, I think we did for a while, and I think what I think you know when we first started, I guess three eleven was around, but we hadn't heard of them and Rage, but we hadn't heard of them yet either. Right. But there was very few. There was very few bands that were kind of doing that, and then as it got to the sort of mid to late nineties, a lot of bands started doing it. And immediately the two biggest bands were Kid Rock and Limp Biscuit, and most people with, yeah. you know, the tastemakers hated those bands. And so immediately anything white boy rap rock just got lumped into new metal, you know, and just it sort of became like a, a parody of itself, you know? And that whole genre sort of, you know, collapsed on itself, except for Kid Rock, who was brilliant and just changed his whole vibe and became a cowboy into whatever. <laughs> right. So that kind of like, I, I saw that coming in the late 90s, and I'm like, I do not want to be lumped in with this whole new metal scene. It just, it just wasn't, I just wasn't, you know, I wasn't my scene. Mm -hmm. um, I liked certain bands, and we had a lot of friends that were, you know, I liked parts of it, but it just wasn't my primary thing. And um, we sort of moved away from that, you know, in the late 90s and went more like, in the direction of, say, like an incubus or a system of a down, which is more like, you know, eclectic, melodic, but still heavy, you know, right. which is kind of what Divided by Zero was when we put, we put the one album out with Divided by Zero. And that that album was sort of like the culmination of those 15 years of songwriting and, and vibe for for Goldspoon. Black sea preserves me in poison, lets me sleep in peace on its lifeless flow. Best hard rock metal band in 2001 for the uh, San Diego Music Awards, man. How were the SDMAs back then? <laughs> Is that just a shit show or what? <laughs> uh, we were sort of like the, the running joke. Like We had been nominated so many times that we, and we never won. We were just like, fuck these people. Let's get drunk and just be obnoxious. And, uh, and then we won. So we were like, oh, we love you guys. This is the best organization ever. <laughs> um, nice. That was, yeah, that was our one and only time we won anything. And uh, it was good. And then we, you know, <laughs> then we immediately changed our name and turned our back on the entire <laughs> <laughs> thing, um, which was, you know, that was sort of like a, a long time coming. Like we had already did, you know, the, the original drummer was gone. The original bass player was gone. We added another guitar player. Mm -hmm. So we were down to two original members and the ghoul spoon name. We had 10, we had had 10 years of um, ups and downs. And we were just, we were sort of like, you know, something has to change because like people hear gold spoon they think you know one thing or right we were sort of pigeonholed you know sure. so we we're looking for a change and we happened to get a management company who signed on for us which ended up being useless but at the time they were like hey you know big management company you guys are great but your name is terrible and we're like cool <laughs> that's that's the that's the impetus we need so we just you know we we did like a, a search and we ended up you know with dbz divided by zero divided by zero and that was sort of like a new direction for us which was which is refreshing and it was a good you know five years of of that um, as a good change of pace, yeah. which eventually fell, eventually fell apart, but we had a good run in, with that as well. Sure. Yeah. I started, uh, in the San Diego scene here in 98. So I definitely remember both you guys, but, uh, I do recall seeing divided by zero. Okay. Um, it may have been in like Canes or seven ten seems to come to mind, uh, which would have been plum crazy. I think back then, right? Yeah. That was uh blind melons forever. Yes. And, uh, blind melons. and then wins. And then Winston's was the other one. So those were, yeah. they were same owners or same man, same booking agents. I'm not sure. Same owners. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we played there a lot because number one, most of us lived in PB or OB. Yep. And number two, um, we were able to do our own door deal. So a lot of the bands would sort of play these clubs and Hey, you get a dollar ahead. And we're like, no, we're going to charge $10 and we're going to take, <laughs> you know, the whole door and you're going to get the bar type of thing. Like we right. were one of the first bands to kind of, I don't know about the first, but we, yeah. we, 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 uh, we, we started doing that and we just, we, we have these big packed shows mm -hmm. and we would actually make money, make money you know? Yeah. So it was, it was good. But, but at the same time, those bars were sort of beach bars. They don't really have any sort of national recognition. They don't have any sort of like, you know, I mean, like if something's happening in San Diego, it's happening at the Casbah or the belly up or, you know, a couple other places. So it's like, we would play these packed shows, but there's no mention of it, you know, in the press or it was sort of like our own little weird beach scene, you know, which became a whole thing unto itself, which was cool. But, uh, we we're like, you know, this is the right move for us to kind of create our own little vibe instead of just being another band on the lineup at the Casbah, which we also still played and still loved, but it was harder to, it was harder to get a regular shot in there. Cause we were pretty, 
Weird. <laughs> Pretty weird. Like the name, right? The name, the name suited you. Yeah. You, you mentioned Ghoul Spoon and, and uh, maybe management or some, someone hating on the name. I like the name. What, what is the backstory behind that? Uh, there, was, there was really none. We just, we just had a list of weird names and we wanted something creepy. We were, just, we were all into the kind of monster vibe. Yeah. Um, for some reason, at the t- I mean, I was really into Fishbone at the time and I just loved the, I loved the way the name Fishbone kind of just, just like a one word Fishbone. Right. So like, like what's, what's a good one? It just, that's just kind of the one that stuck and uh just in retrospect it's just it was just misspelled so much it was just i mean <laughs> i'd say 90 percent of the time it was spelled g-o-u-l without the h and i'm like uh, it's a real word we didn't make up the word ghoul like what right. the hell <laughs> and it was just, it, it was it was like two words or, or it was like goldstone or i mean yeah. try try telling a person who's never heard your band name what your band name is and that's the test so we're like yeah, oh you're cool you're in a band what are you called goldstone Goldstone, a ghoul spoon, good, good, still good, <laughs> like you know, and that happened for ten years. <laughs> so, just got sick of it. You finally just started uh, agreeing with them. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, so we just it was just like it was just a sort of thing. We we're like we need a change and a fresh start. So divided by zero just seemed like a cool vibe and uh, alliteration of words and logo and the whole thing. So we kind of just rolled with that. I swear there's a new generation uh, divided by zero out there, man, because I was searching it and I'll, I'll search yeah, there it is. on my... There is. Huh? Those fuckers now. <laughs> well, there's a... There, there's, I don't know if there's more than one, but there was one. It was sort of like a, an EDM outfit and um, yeah. they had this song on Spotify called like Panic Remix or something and they, they lumped it on our page for years and I could not get it off there. Oh, wow. Um, but Spotify, since they introduced their like Spotify artist, now you can actually communicate with them. So I had it moved to their own page. Gotcha. But um, <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah, I, I don't know who they are, but I think they're. I think they're from Europe, and they're like an EDM yeah. band. But we let that lapse anyway. They could have it. We. <laughs> that's why. That's why I built my own website for me, just because all of our, all of my previous band websites have all lapsed. I'm just like I don't want to maintain everything. I'll just have one under my name, you know. <laughs> right. And you're doing some solo stuff. I, I've been following you on social media. Uh, you rock out some acoustic tunes every once in a while. Is that sort of what you're up to these days? Uh, yeah, I'm up. Well, I'm up to. Uh, I, I was up to a whole lot before the lockdown. But right. I, um, when when uh, I started my own band after Divided by Zero broke up in around 2009, 2010, called uh, The Secret Seven, and that was sort of um, basically all my acoustic songs that I've had for years. And my my solo stuff tends to be more kind of Beatlesy and kind of like you know, Elvis Costello, ELO, like that, you know, Bowie, that kind of like 60s, 70s vibe. Yeah. So I basically put a band together um, to sort of, you know, support those songs. And we put out two albums, um, 2010 and 2013. Yeah. And they were really good. And we, we were, we were kind of rolling along, but then we, I ended up moving to LA. Yeah. Um, so that kind of lapsed. <laughs> yeah. And then um, had two kids in quick succession who are now seven and or just about to be seven and four. So the last like six years have been baby stuff for me. Yeah. And, um, and so in the meantime, I sort of just started doing some cover band projects, um, which is, I just sort of like didn't look for anything and things kind of found me over the last few years. So I started doing, um, I'm in a yacht rock band called the windbreakers, which is sort of like a sort of like a paid gig, which you know play big corporate stuff, and it, that's super fun and also challenging to to sing this stuff. Um, I was doing a Beatles project where we did um, the whole Abbey Road album start to finish live in like a theater, so we did yeah. that for the last year. How fun! Um, and then I did a um, I'm in a band called Geezer, which I've been doing for ten years, which <laughs> is a um, Weezer cover. We basically. We dress, well, we started out as a Weezer cover, then we decided we don't really want to just do Weezer, so we do. We have a whole Beastie Boys set. We have um, it's, it's basically like all '90s songs, but we dress up as old men. Yes, I love it. And man. that, and that was actually really. We, we've been doing great with that for ten years, I and mean, we headline pretty big venues, and um, cool. you know, have a good following, and it's super fun, super creative, um, a lot of improv. We've done comedy clubs. Um, we have a whole '90s rap set where it's all like you know Humpty Dance and Dr. Dre and all this stuff, which is super fun. So that was sort of the focus of my creative goofiness for the last ten years. Right. Um, then I also had like two other bands that I did their cover stuff, and then um, yeah, the stuff you were talking about that was on social media for the last few months was just during lockdown. I started covering yeah. a song a day acoustically. Um, I did it for 99 days. I just stopped and it was to raise uh, money for my local food bank in LA here in Culver city. So basically all the money that I was like, Hey, tip jar and all the money I forwarded right to the, 
the food bank to feed, uh, you know, people that needed food during the pandemic. So I, cause I, I have so little time, like the kids are here now full time with no school. So it's like, and you know, you're, you're, you. you're just stuck at your house. So for like a half an hour a day, I'm like, cool, whatever, what song am I going to learn today? I'll learn this song, go out there, do one or two takes, put it up there and then do another one tomorrow. So I did that for <laughs> 99 days straight. I hear you, brother. I got a seven year old here and I try to incorporate, we're doing school of rock every once in a while on YouTube. It's uh nice. You got to stay creative, right? Yeah. You, you can't really, you can't really pick what they're into. So you just kind of got to roll with it. Like, right. My older guy's not super into rock yet. Some stuff he is. Like he likes like Motley Crue and a couple of random things, but he's into like, you know, Old Town Road and Minecraft and <laughs> yeah. you know. Yep. Who knows what he's into? I try to turn him on to the old weird stuff from the seventies and eighties and he's just like, I don't care, Dad. <laughs> Going outside and stuff. Yeah, the old the old timer stuff. Yeah, you know, you you know, writing with writing with a pencil, yeah. you know. Yeah. <laughs> I know. We talked about it with Bucko Nine, you know, uh, definite local legends. Craig, the uh, saxophone player, he's been with Bucko Nine for 30 years. I'm sure you know him, right? Craig Yarnold? Of course. Yeah, I know, I know Craig. I know John. I know uh, Jonas, all those guys. Yeah. Yeah. We were kind of bringing it back last week, last episode to, you know, the growing up in the 80s, 90s and how different it was and how sort of fortunate we are that we had that. For sure. I mean, it's, it's a cliche, but it's like that t-shirt, you know, it's like, I may be old, but I got to see all the good bands. Right. Yeah. There, there, there's still great music being made, but it's, you know, our, you know, our generation definitely had a good run there. <laughs> right. With some good music. I think it's cool to look back on older music nineties and, and before and think that it wasn't so overproduced. I mean, I guess a lot of bands were, but there wasn't a lot of the auto tune and the melodyne and this and that, you know, it was a little more raw. Yeah. I mean, obviously there's exceptions when it comes to, you know, Boston and ELO and seventies production, but I mean, sure. um, yeah, it's, it is what it is. There's, there's still tons of great bands. It's just rock is a rock now is a, um, a fringe genre. It's like jazz, you know, it's just not, it's not the primary. It used to be the soundtrack of our lives. It used to be political. It used to be uh, coming of age. And now it's, you know, I, I would defy you to find any teenager that's cranking rock from their car. I mean, it's 99.9% <laughs> hip hop and pop. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you got to like, I would say like Imagine Dragons is like pop rock now, right? Yeah. the only, that's why I think that's yeah. why they get hated on so much. One of the only bands that matter, right? <laughs> 21 Pilots, Imagine Dragons, and uh, Maroon 5. <laughs> yeah, the only bands that are the only quote unquote rock bands that that chart anymore. Even when like Foo Fighters or Green Day comes out with a new album, it just it's here for a week and goes away, right? They're not they haven't had huge smashes in a long time. I, yeah, I suppose you're right for sure. I guess you'd have to include, um, you know, Fallout Boy still gets up there as well as uh, Panic at the Disco. They're still, but still, like Panic at the Disco is more pop now. Yeah, they're the they're the last um, they're the last bands that are big enough to you know co headline a stadium. Well, we'll see how that would have went. The tour got canceled, but you know they were about to yep. do that stadium tour with Green Day and Weezer. I had the ticket. Yeah. So th th that's yeah, and there are some good bands that are still. I mean, obviously, I like a lot of new music still, but it's sure. yeah, it's not the same as it was when. I mean, look at like. We well, sound like old guys now, but yeah, look at you I know, know. <laughs> I know. But there was, I mean, there was the '90s were just such a great time for music. Yeah. But there was, yeah, there was a lot of diversity too. That's which is what, what was great about San Diego. You know, I mean, bands like, you know, I don't know how other cities were, but I mean, a band like Buck Nine, who was, a, you know, a straight up ska band, right. and a band like, um, I don't know, Pod, who was a Christian rap band, can can be total bros and just like you know play the same bill, and all the fans dug it. You know. Did you ever meet up with Stone Temple Pilots? I think they had some ties here. Um, yeah, I mean, we have a lot of friends in common. Um, Josh, Josh, who um, ended up being in Fluff, he was really good friends with those guys, I think. Um, they were, I knew of them when they were Mighty Joe Young, right before they changed their name. Wow. Um, and I didn't know them. I didn't see them. I saw, I first really heard of them when they did their video with the plush video, and I just didn't dig it i just thought it was it wasn't my thing um, yeah, yeah sure um just to, just to be honest and um I, I just i'm like the one guy who doesn't like pearl jam also like i don't hate them i just they're just not my i just don't love pearl jam and right. uh that that video the plush video he like just it was just like such a pearl jam ripoff to my sensibilities i'm like god these guys are like who are they it just wasn't my thing yeah. and um they ended up filming that video, Wicked Garden, at soma remember their second i don't know if their second or third single off that album wow i didn't know that actually 
Crazy. Yeah, look up the look up the video for Wicked Garden. It was filmed at the Old Soma, which was sort of our hometown club. So everyone's like, "Hey, come to the Stone Temple Pilots video taping." And I was like, "Fuck those guys! They're taking over. <laughs> they're from L.A." They're, you know, and and, lo- and looking back, I'm like, "God, that would have been awesome to go to." You know, they ended up becoming a legendary band. It would have been cool. Yeah. But at the time, when you're 20 years old, you're like, "Fuck those guys! They're from L.A. They're not from San Diego." <laughs> Why do people say they're from San Diego? I've heard that before. Uh, I, th- I think two of the guys. I think the Delio brothers w- were from San Diego, and then the Got it. other either. Scott or Eric, the drummer, were from L.A. or something like that, but they were they were signed out of L.A., but a couple of them lived in San Diego, so they kind of claimed local band status for a while. I don't really remember the whole story. Right. But they, yeah, they, they ended up doing okay for themselves. Who's your favorite pop band? You have a, a seven-year-old you mentioned. Uh, my daughter's really into 21 Pilots. She loves them, and I think they're good at writing songs. I think they have some great songs. And who's someone you hear that's popular that you're really into? Um, 21 Pilots is good. They're they're not like I don't like love them, but they're I have I have no problems with them, and they're definitely a guilty pleasure. Like there's that I can't really find any flaws. <laughs> right. <laughs> but I don't yeah. know. I don't know. I just like my my innate like oh they're on the radio, so they must be sellouts. You know, type of like old school vibe. But there's nothing. They're they're. They're killer. I mean, God, the guy can write a write a song for sure. Right. Um, I mean, all the stuff I listen to is like you know, I like a lot of power pop and sort of like things like that. Like not, I, I'm like not a surf a lot. That's a band that's they're not new, but they're putting out amazing albums. Stuff like Flaming Lips and you know the Shins. I'm a huge Shins fan. The band Dawes, I love. They're like one of my favorite bands. Nobody's super super new. I have certain songs here and there that I like. Um, my kid is super into Post Malone and Old Town Road. Those are his two go tos. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the reason why that happened is because my wife works for Sony here in LA, and she oh, wow. she worked on the Spider Man, the Spider Verse movie that won the Oscar, and so the, we were listening to the soundtrack over and over. And there's that song on the soundtrack. The um, sunflower. It's like. Uh, oh yeah. I don't know, you, you probably know it if you have a kid. Yeah. 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 I do. <laughs> and, yeah. Yeah. It's a good song. It's like super catchy, and um, I'm like, I can't deny it. it's a good song. And uh, so he listens to that over and over and over again. That one <laughs> and the other one on that soundtrack. The uh, the what's up danger. <laughs> That's yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Post Malone's sort of unique. Yeah, he's he's sort of all over the all across the board. He definitely he definitely grew on me. I was like super anti, like you know, gut level. Like this guy sucks. He has face tattoos. He's talentless. And I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> this guy is actually. I watched that Nirvana thing he did, and I was like floored. I'm like, wow, that guy is really talented for sure. That gave me a new respect for him. I wasn't too into him, but yeah, seeing him rock with I think Travis Barker that quarantine Nirvana thing that was pretty cool. That was cool. Um, but yeah, all the stuff that I'm into, like the last, I mean, I, I like like mellow more. I don't really listen to a lot of heavy music. Um, I like, you know, like like Band of Horses. I like, you know, Bonnie Vare, uh, Blake Mills, Ryan Adams, you know, that kind of stuff. Cool. Um, and some, you know, some like Jason Isbell and, you know, alternative country weird stuff. But um, I don't know. There's not really a lot of like, I don't, I don't know where the new like jane's addiction is or who's the new you know who is the new uh sound garden or whoever you know i don't i don't i don't know um yeah i listen to i listen to all the spotify playlists and, and a song comes on here and there that i like for sure um i like right. that band bully you know b-u-l-l-y bully they're great i'll have to check um, them out it's a female singer and she's also a producer and she's really good They've, they actually just put a new album out yesterday but um yeah. or today yeah but um you know those type of bands i mean i guess the closest that's happened in the last well, i guess there's bands like royal blood you know and and um things like that but uh i got a shout out to greta van fleet i was just about to say greta van fleet's like the only one but i mean they're just they just sound so much like led zeppelin it's like i want to like them but it's just so derivative right i'm hoping they kind of come into their own and you know maybe you know their next album will be a departure but i just couldn't get on board it was just too derivative for my aging you know connoisseur (laughs) zeppelin fanatic head totally the singer does like similar moves too you know as robert plant and uh i haven't seen him live yet but it's a bit of a ripoff a little bit but it's kind of cool to see kids doing that you know yeah for sure 100 percent. and like it's totally it's, it's awesome and um you know, not hating at all. Just for me personally, I'm not going to put it on and listen to it more than a couple times. I tend to like more of the melodic kind of like Beatles-y, power poppy, acoustic-y stuff as I get older. Just It's just my taste, you know? Yeah. No, totally. but I, st- I still stay. I still listen to everything. I listen to the release radar on Spotify every week and hear if something stands out. And, you know, if so, I'll dig deeper into it. Um, I still go to tons of shows, or I did. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, I'll always buy... I'll always buy the the album on vinyl for 20 bucks if, you know, they're selling it live to support them. Yeah. So I still try to stay 
abreast of what's going on. And I'm, I'm a huge hip hop guy too, but that also kind of took a left turn, you know, into, right. you got to dig deeper to find the good stuff. And like, right. run, I like run the jewel, like run the jewels is one of the best albums. I mean, for sure of this year, but that like they're, they, they stand out. They're incredible. Um, yeah. Both MCs are just the sickest. Like their words are great, but um, um, see that sick MC. See how current I am. <laughs> <laughs> are you into Eminem and his new stuff? Uh, yeah, I actually have a good Eminem story too from <laughs> back in the day. Really? So I don't know. My my so my day job for a long time during the '90s was um, I worked for a company called Sick World, which was we made all the funny T-shirts that sponsored all the bands in the scene. Mm-hmm. Um, so we were the ones that made the fuck you fucking fuck shirt and like a bunch of other stuff like that. <laughs> mm-hmm. So we would spot, we would do merch for a bunch of bands. We would, you know, like zebra head were good buddies of ours. We made their merch and Cole chamber and like all these, you know, slipknot. We did like stuff for them. Um, so we got a lot of like backstage sort of like, you know, Ozfest invites and things like that to certain, you know, events. And mm-hmm. so one of the people we sponsored very, very early on, I want to say like 98 or 99 was, uh, Eminem. Like wow. right, literally, like right when he came out, like mm-hmm. his he hadn't broken huge, huge, huge yet. He was just he was doing the Warp Tour. I want to say ninety nine, ninety nine Warp Tour, maybe. Okay, we got a, a pass through his whatever it was, Paul. What, uh, what's his name? Paul something. Yeah, the guy that always leaves the uh, messages. Um, Paul, listen, Joel just called me and he told me you're in the back behind the studio shooting your gun off in the air like it's a shooting range yeah so we so anyway anyway, we went he was super cool super nice super humble um he was with his buddy proof you know the side his his sidekick that got murdered later on um and we and we ended up hanging with him the whole day on his bus just like shooting the shit drinking beer smoking weed like hanging out the entire day with eminem wow until it's like until it's like time to go on stage he like went on stage and played the show wearing our shirts and like I, i still have like i'd forgotten about it for years but I still have like the paper he gave me was like, Hey dude, next time you're in Detroit, look me up. And it's like Marshall Mathers. Here's my home number with my, you know, <laughs> wow. I never called it, but I still have it. Right. So I was, yeah. So I was definitely a fan early on. Like right when he broke, I was like, that's our friend. That's our guy. Hi, my name is, Hi, my name is, I loved his early shit, you know, rapping about acid and you know, nothing but drugs. And then he got clean and it's still good. <laughs> yeah. He, he, he definitely fell off for a while, but his last like three have been outstanding. How is it to, to, you know, rub elbows with all these guys, you know, POD and 311 and Deftones, Korn, Eminem, and then, and then see them blow up. Most, most of those guys were not super famous when we met them and they're just regular dudes. And I'm sure they're the, you know, I haven't talked to most of them in many years and I'm sure they're the same way for the most part. Um, I mean, Jonathan, like the two guys in Corn, John and um, Brian were the super, super nice guys, really friendly, really humble. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't know Deftones guys that well. And the bass player was super friendly. Um, never really, never really hung out with Chino much. Um, yeah. I, don't, I don't really, you know, it's just superficial, honestly. I, I can say, hey, we're good buddies, but we were, we we're, 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 you know, you see somebody to show, you look at me, you give them a nod, you know, you, right. <laughs> you hand the mic to them and walk the other way. Basically, it's like, that's. We, we didn't have a deep relationship. Um, I mean, one of the, one of the guys that I knew a little bit and I still tell people that, you know, don't believe it. The most humble, like nicest guy ever is Mark McGrath from Sugar Ray. Total sweetheart. And, um, like back cause they were, they basically started in like, I guess it was Newport maybe, but they they played San Diego all the time. And, uh, they were called shrinky dinks and they were like, they were amazing. They were so good. They were like, they're like, have you ever seen Steel Panther? They're like Steel Panther before Steel Panther. Okay. Just like total like joke, cock rock, like hilarious front man. It was like watching Jim Carrey like front Steel Panther. <laughs> they changed quite a bit for uh, Sugar Ray. Yeah, we we played with them at I want to say like Canes or someplace, and like after the show, I'm like, I'm like, you, you're like you're you're so good. He's like, no, no, we're a joke band. You guys are good, you know. And meanwhile, then they like got signed to Atlantic, changed their name, put out Fly, and the rest is history. Wow. But that guy is still a total go- goof. He's just like total little normal wacky guy so definitely respect for mark mcgrath but um i mean and i read into what's his name from uh brandon from incubus a couple years ago up here in la and talked to him and i was like hey ghouls he's like oh what's up dude like you know he rem- they, they all remember the old days but uh right. that's right you know, we were just we were just show buddies you know we weren't like close close friends since i've lived in la i've i've had more cel- <laughs> like everyone lives next door to a celebrity up here in la so it's sort of like normal you go to you go to vons and it's like oh that's uh, the dude from csi hey yeah so <laughs> how you like in la compared to san diego it's just totally different you know it's i i, I love both places but I, I was in san diego for 20 years and i'm not from san diego so it's it wasn't like i didn't have any attachment to it other than my friends and sort of like my memories so i wasn't like 
leaving behind my mom and dad or anything, you know? So, um, it was, I love San Diego is a great lifestyle. The thing, um, the thing that I love about LA the most besides the history of it, you know, just, it's just, everything is incredibly historic in terms of film and television and, and music is that everybody you meet up here does something, which is, was really refreshing to me. Um, because San Diego is just such a different vibe. People kind of go there because they want a certain lifestyle, you know, and a lot of exceptional people do live in San Diego. Um, but it's not the norm. Like in LA, you're like, ev- I mean, everybody, it's just so weird and so cool because you have these incredible, you know, you, you literally like go to the dog park and you the, whoever start a conversation with a random guy. It's like, oh, what do you do? And he's like, oh, I'm the um, touring guitar player for Green Day. Oh, I'm, you know, I'm the, uh, I, I did the soundtrack for uh, Dr. Sleep. I'm the, wow. you know, whatever, like everybody yeah. has some like industry thing they do. So it's, it's always interesting, you know? Yeah. So I, I do like that because I am a kind of ambitious, creative person. And um, yeah. I mean, I grew up, I'm from New York. So I was, I mean, you know, I'm a fast talker. I'm very like, right. you know, <laughs> sort of like, you know, I like that kind of thing. And yeah. um, so it's fun for me. Um, awesome. but <laughs> unfortunately, right when I got here, I had two kids right away. So it sort of like curtailed my, uh, <laughs> sunset strip debauchery. Damn kids. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think COVID will have a permanent effect on the music industry? Uh, yeah, uh, for sure. I mean, I, I don't see how it can't. I mean, it's the industry for sure. I, I don't know enough about the financials to, to give you an educated, answer but i I know that the little people will all go away if they haven't already gone away i mean in terms of like production companies management companies agents record labels um venues obviously um i mean if you don't have enough capital (laughs) or credit right now to float yourself for a year or two um you can't survive i mean you know people are just dropping like flies um which means that the bigger places you know the live nations and the aegs and all these places will basically swallow up the little fish and it will become even more you know monopolistic it's unfortunate so that's gonna have an effect and then in terms of live events like who knows i mean I, can you could you picture yourself going to a live event anytime in the foreseeable future and like rubbing elbows with people right uh, you know i just can't even picture it and even if you can who's gonna who the imagine the insurance involved in that for the promoter if someone gets sick and they sue them or it's like, who knows what that landscape is going to look like. And the trickle down is so massive in terms of, I mean, I forgot how much it's like what five, a five billion dollar industry. I mean, the guy, the stage hand, the, the, you know, the roadies, the managers, this, and, I mean, everybody is getting hurt by it. Not to mention just the bands, you know? So it's, yeah, I, I think it's going to affect it for a long time. And, um, I have no idea how it's going to end up. I don't know if, live music will be a thing for I think I think all these tours that are being rescheduled now will all be canceled for sure really even next for, year for ne- for next summer yeah yeah uh, are you seeing a lot of venues do live streams uh Casbah's doing that I've watched a few I mean I, I watch as many as I can um I have a lot of friends that do it obviously every you know other day on Facebook and try to support them um we've been asked to do one the the, the yacht rock band's been asked to do a few of them oh cool but I don't, I don't know I just not quite the same, right? I mean, not quite the same as a band and for the audience, right? It's just everyone's adapting, but it's just not the same. No, I mean, definitely not the same. I mean, I, I feel bad for, on one hand, we're screwed because we have young kids and it's like just really challenging to be stuck at home, you know, especially trying to work your day job, like on a computer and answer emails with your kid around all the time. It's just very challenging. Right. On the other hand, imagine being single right now and like <laughs> being totally alone or trying to meet people or, you know, that's a whole nother challenge. I feel terrible for, you know, seniors in high school that aren't going to get their senior year or miss their prom or, you know, can't go to college or have no job, you know, options once they get out of college. It's just, it's just a shit show. You know, Yeah, it really is. 2020 is the ultimate shit show. That is the slogan for 2020. Yeah. 2020 is canceled. 2020, the shit show. It's crazy times and a fucking election year. Yeah, that's that's a whole nother topic. Yeah, an election year. I mean, climate change, like, you know, all these crazy things that are happening in the world. It's just, it's really, I guess it was always weird, you know? I mean, right. when I was born, it was like riots and Vietnam and Nixon and all these crazy stuff. And now it's right. something, now it's exactly the same, actually. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've, I've made that connection, certain parallels to the 60s a little bit, huh? With the uh, police brutality and civil unrest, yeah, riots in the streets. We just have fat. We just have fat Nixon in charge. You know? <laughs> it's like let I them, actually let them haven't heard that. 
Fat Nixon. So yeah, it's uh, it's a pretty pretty scary time, but the kids are doing okay, and you know, Good there's still music being made. Fortunately, it's right. it's easier than ever to to create music at home. So I mean, there's still yeah. people putting out music and being yeah. creative, but making a living that's a whole it was hard enough before right <laughs> we're seeing a lot of people pivot and adapt and do some unique cool things and venues are trying to survive so uh yeah you know we wish them the best are you seeing a lot of uh, small venues down there drop like flies close their doors well yeah i mean they all they all closed obviously in m- march but um m- most of them may not reopen i mean there's some i mean the, the teragram is a beautiful venue you know, I go to a lot of shows there. That's probably not going to make it. I mean, there's, there's a bunch of them that that may not make it. Um, I don't. Yeah, I don't know what their monetary situation is, but I don't. I can't see how you can go two years, one or two years, without any revenue. Right. Um, I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's 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 terrible because there's so many beautiful venues. Totally. Um, I mean, that's a big part of my life. Obviously, playing shows, going to shows, is just really sad. And hopefully, you know, we'll get our shit together and. Even if even if there's not a vaccine, hopefully we could have some leadership where it's like, hey, let's shut it all down again for 90 days. Everyone gets paid not to work. Let's knock it out like other countries have done. Like some some cohesive plan, you know. It's just it's just it's a, it's a challenge because America is so strong willed and we're you know everyone likes their freedom, so it's can't tell us what to do. Right. So it's 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 not uh, the same as other countries, which makes it a lot harder to get on the same page, you know. <laughs> Any advice to a local musician right now? <laughs> I mean, not to be, we don't, we try not to discourage musicians. There's a lot of locals that listen uh, down here in San Diego, but. Uh, no, I would say the most important thing is to write a good song and to learn how to write a good song and focus on your songwriting and your craft um, and keep doing it and just get experience. I mean, it's hard to get experience now, but just play as much as you can in, what, in whatever your chosen, you know, genre is or, or field. Obviously, you know, just keep keep trying and keep practicing. And then, and I'd also say like, you know, don't take it so seriously in terms of keep your options open. Cause that was, that was one of the things like looking back on with Goolspoon was like, Oh, we were so, we have to make it and blah, 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 blah. And we, and you know, we can't do side projects. I was like Metallica, you know, no side projects, you know, okay. and looking back on it, it's like, I could have totally done, you know, other stuff at the same time and put out an acoustic album. Like all the bands sort of break up because they can't, you know, it's like, take a year off, do a solo album, come back, you know, it's like, don't, everything isn't everything all the time. You know, you can take a break, you can do other stuff, you can play with other people, um, do a banjo album if that's what you want to do and then go back to your band. You know, it doesn't have to be all or nothing. Um, I wish I had diversified earlier because, you know, as I got older, I'm like, hey, I'm going to play in this band, that band. And it's so much more rewarding as a musician. But back then it was like, make it or, you know, all or nothing. That's definitely part of it because you do have to, you know, dedicate yourself a lot. But I mean, look at someone like Mike Patton, who's in 10 bands and they're all cool in different ways, you know. So it's like, do your own thing. Yeah. Be good at it. Write good songs. And, uh, you know, always be nice to the bands you meet on the way up because you're going to meet them on the way back down. Great advice. I always think of that line and that thing you do. I'm sure you've seen that movie, but Del Paxton, you know, <laughs> he, he tells Guy Patterson, just keep playing, man, just keep playing. And it's so true. You know, bands will come and go. One of my favorite movies, I just rewatched it because I'm a huge Fountains of Wayne fan, so I was like pretty heartbroken when Adam Schlesinger yeah, died. Yeah, they wrote that song, yep. I'm looking, at, I'm looking at a signed poster of him right here. Incredible. Um, that I got it brick by brick back in 90, whatever. But uh, yeah, I just watched the, that thing you do, the 40-minute cut. You know, the, Have you seen that one, the director's cut? They added 40 minutes to it. I didn't. So this was about this was the 20-year anniversary, which would have been 2016 probably. Um, they put out a director's cut, of, and they added 40 minutes to it. It's all this extra stuff that wasn't in their theatrical release. It's great. It like explains the whole storyline with Charlie's Theron and the dentist, wow. and um, Tom Hanks is gay. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, with with how with Howie Long. What? Oh my god. <laughs> yeah, there's a whole like subplot about that. Oh, don't look so sad, Lloyd. We'll be fashionably late. Oh, I got to get this. Absolutely. One of my favorite, like, feel-good music movies, dude. I mean, when they first hear their, you know, their single on the radio and running down the street, it's just, it gives me goosebumps, dude. It's amazing. It's, yeah, it's, it's almost a perfect film, and it's Tom Hanks' first directorial debut, which is incredible, like, his first movie. It's so good. Yeah, I watch it over and over again, actually. It's one of my favorite movies. <laughs> yeah, I always think of that line, though, because it is good advice. You know, bands come and go. You just got to keep playing. 
and diver- diversify and think out of the box as a musician. And I think a lot of people are. I'm seeing some pretty creative stuff out there. You know, local musicians playing from their driveway, going live from their driveway. Yeah. Cool, man. Well, keep rocking. And, uh, you know, hopefully the San Diego music scene will thrive once again. And I um, can't wait to go play down there again and see all my friends. And uh, I appreciate you keeping the old days memories alive absolutely bro it's so cool to sort of reminisce and uh you know i've been playing a band since 98 years so uh, catching up yeah catching up with the guys like you i had uh sunny and marcos on from pod chat with them oh, cool. um yeah buck 09 uh Sprum monkey i had ernie ernie on oh cool so it's really cool to catch up nice to chat with you zach goody zach goody.com yeah z-a-c-h so look that up yeah z-a-c-h-g-o-o-d-e i thought it was pronounced good so my bad. Uh, you know, <laughs> it goes back and forth, but Zach Goody has a good, it's easier to, to e- easier to remember. Right. So, Dude, all the very best to you and your family uh, during these crazy times, man. And uh, thanks a lot for your time. I appreciate it. You too, man. We'll talk soon. Thank you so much. Palapalooza, we're talking to you. I'm Palapalooza.